Number 10. There are substances on set. Actors using substances on set is nothing new. A lot of people are pretty sure that Seth Rogen smokes his herbs and spices on set constantly. Something he's admitted to doing before, but not as often as the internet makes it out to be. However, in the earlier days of Hollywood, substances were not only done on set, they were encouraged by the studios, who would regularly feed their actors their narcotic of choice on set. In fact, John Belushi from the Blues Brothers was such an avid consumer of no-no snow that the price of powder was built into the budget for the 1980 flick. No wonder he's in sunglasses all day. If he took them off, he'd look like he just got pepper sprayed or something. I don't know what happens when you do that stuff. I'm a good boy, I promise. Facts are that this still takes place to this day. Now, I have signed a few NDAs in my time as a locations PA, so I cannot specify who does what and where, but the amount of celebrities that surprisingly love that no-no snow is astonishing. No wonder so many people deliver great performances, it's because they amp themselves up in a bathroom for five minutes before every scene. Number nine, Jim Carrey's Origins. A Canadian legend, Jim Carrey is considered one of the greatest modern comedians of all time. He famously released three films in the year 1995, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and Ace Ventura, all of which made millions at the box office and still hold up to this day. Except for a couple scenes in Ace Ventura, but we won't get into that. As many know, comedians tend to have a pretty rough backstory as the best comedy comes from a place of pain. Over the years, Jim has come clean about his strange but fun upbringing. His family struggled financially and he grew up watching his mother struggle with depression, which he claims to have been passed down to him. Despite his energy, he was a bit of a recluse growing up, and apparently he spent hours in his room making faces in the mirror instead of hanging out with his friends. After dropping out of high school to work a full-time job, Jim and his family were actually forced to live in a Volkswagen van together, becoming homeless for a short period of time. He went on to attempt a career in comedy, at first to minimal success, but of course he was able to find his footing and made his place in comedy history. Number 8. There are ties to the Mafia The film industry may be a multi-billion dollar business, but where did they get that first bit of cash from to get where they are today? Well, apparently Hollywood has a dark history that's tied to organized crime families. The Trocadero, or the Troc, was a famous spot on the Sunset Strip back in the day. With many celebrities coming through the doors, along with studio heads and notorious mob leaders like Mickey Cohen, who was a regular at the establishment. He was a man who rubbed elbows with many of Hollywood. Hollywood's A-list. In fact, the film Texas Chainsaw Massacre, released in the 1970s, was released by Bryanston Pictures, a company heavily linked to several crime families. While the production studio ended up going bankrupt, Hollywood is still filled with many people doing secret deals. I bet all of the money in my savings account that they had something to do with this Barbenheimer nonsense. Now that's not a lot of money, but the mob runs the memes. It's confirmed. Number 7. Woody Harrelson's Father Woody is best known in Hollywood as the wildest wild child ever to exist. He eats raw meat, he's an eco-crusader, he's a protester against violence, and an advocate for the legalization of herbs and spices in the United States. He's loved on screen, but did you know that his father took people out for money and I'm not talking about on dates? That's a different job. Charles Harrelson was sentenced to two lifetime sentences for the slaying of a federal judge in San Antonio. And prior to that charge, Charles had previously been acquitted for the slaying of Alan Berg, who was a carpet salesman. And he was convicted of the slaying of Sam Degalia. He's not the greatest hitman of all time. His track record will prove that. The evidence shows that Charles is not the greatest hitman of all time. Woody doesn't speak much of his father these days, opting instead to leave his family's trouble in the past. He does, however, say that the one piece of advice that his father ever gave him that he still uses to this day is always keep an open mind. Charles knew all about opening minds with bullets. Number six, they have backups of A-listers. There have been many rumors over the years that Hollywood likes to clone their best and brightest on the off chance that they'll need them again following their ultimate demise. According to the internet, Paul Rudd actually got to star alongside his clone in the show Living With Yourself. Now, Paul has of course claimed that the performance was achieved with CGI and filming one character one day and another the next, but Paul Rudd is also 54 years old and looks like that, so something is not right about this. Now, there is a theory out there that the celebrity elites are made up of lizard people who take the form of actors and singers to influence us. And Paul is thought to be one of those lizard people. Now, I don't believe this theory. I'm just sharing something cool that I found on the internet. But it would be awesome if there were two Paul Rudds. In fact, that would be the most chill way to find out that cloned people exist. Just Paul being like, Hi, I'm Paul. And, Hi, I'm also Paul. 
everything's gonna be fine. Number five, Mark Wahlberg should be in jail. Maki Mack and a Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991, and despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids show, the crew had a small following and garnered a bit of success. Enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted and picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark play the leading man Danny Wallace, a police officer who attempts to stop substance trafficking and corruption by the Chinese triads. He's had a successful acting career that has recently been declined in quality, but he's still acting and he looks jacked at the age of 52, so please don't hurt me, Mark. Infinite was just hard to watch. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young, and he became addicted to No No Snow by the time he was in his mid teens. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested when he was just 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was walking home late one night under the influence of a hallucinogenic narcotic when he spotted the men. Close friends at the time have confirmed that Mark had a racial biased upbringing which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who just wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them which did make contact and knocked one of the men unconscious. He was eventually released after serving only 45 days of his two year prison sentence and he vowed to change his life. Now so far he's kept that promise and I can personally confirm that he's very polite and patient because he actually watched a movie at the theater I used to work at. He does travel with a crew of five people at all times surrounding him. It's a bit intimidating, just a little. Number four, Margot Robbie may be crazy. Margot may be a perfect Barbie on screen, but apparently behind the scenes, she might be a psychopath. In a recent interview with BBC Radio 1, Margot reminisced about a little prank that she pulled on an old babysitter that involved kitchen cutters, which is the word I'm forced to use for the thing that you cut tomatoes with. Apparently, Margot had just gotten a new babysitter, a much older woman that just apparently wasn't as cool as Talia. So she hatched a plan of sweet, sweet revenge. After a particularly trying day where Margot refused to take a bath, she decided to kick the old lady out for good. She grabbed ketchup, her stabby jabby things, and laid face down on the kitchen tiles. You know, the old I've been stabbed routine. As you may expect, her babysitter walked in, took one look, screamed, and just ran out the door. Traumatized, the woman quit and Margot successfully got her old babysitter back. But that is messed up. That is so messed. And Margot was like young when she did this. Like it's a very dark place for someone's mind to go so early on in their life. Has she secretly been a little bit crazy this whole time? It might explain why she was so good as Harley Quinn. Number three, Tim Allen's Hobbies. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear and the star of ABC's popular sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. While he may have played a family man on TV, many fans may not know that Tim was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a few bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport Port, what a name, and was caught with more than 650 grams, 1.4 pounds of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 grams or more. Like as he was being arrested, there was a guy in a car with him like, and if you have 650 grams, you're a goner. However, that sentence was never served as it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities, it led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state, so being able to ignore that new policy entirely. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. Can that be a movie, please? Number two, CGI'd before they pass. Unfortunately, computers are not only making everyone's lives easier when it comes to looking cool on screen, but they're also being used in some of the creepiest ways ever. So, the first example of someone being CGI'd into a movie following their passing was Carrie Fisher. And I do mean first to have a speaking line and be a significant character. Rise of Skywalker did not heavily feature her, but the fact that they had that ready to go so fast after she passed, it was super unnerving. They 
They pulled this with Stan Lee too in one of his last on-screen cameos, and Marvel was going to do this with Chadwick Boseman in the sequel to Black Panther, but the studio changed their minds last minute and thank the good lord. But not only is Hollywood prepared to CGI their people into movies, they seem to have inside knowledge of when it's going to happen. With the new addition of AI into the world of film, we're close to Hollywood not even needing actors anymore and just asking the computer to make Tom Cruise do stunts. Deep fake technology is also getting better and better, making it extremely difficult to tell if a video is authentic or just some CGI shenanigans. Nope, still just me. Number one, they're all broke. That's right, despite it being one of the most lucrative industries in the world, most of Hollywood's actors, writers, directors aren't as well off as we may think. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past month, most of Hollywood is closed right now as its staff are on strike. Some of the toppest of tier actors have joined their crew in solidarity, not stopping until Hollywood's producers and big budget studios start sharing the money that they make. Actor Sean Gunn gave an interview this last week where he mentions working on a show currently streaming on Deflix, a show that has made over $4 million in residuals of which he's received basically nothing. This type of financial woe extends to a ton of people in Hollywood, and I just wanted to take this moment to wish luck to anyone out there on the picket lines. Hollywood, pay your people, and everyone holding a sign or waiting for the strike to end, get what you're worth, and get back to making the world a better place. Number 10, Innuendos. Disney is a brand that is aimed at wholesome family content able to be enjoyed by all. This means that sometimes they like to put some more adult jokes and references into their movies. Most are not obvious, but some definitely are. In Lion King, a certain three-letter word is spelled out in the clouds, a word which means making love. However, the most disturbing hidden meanings seem to come from one specific series, Toy Story. Now, there are the obvious in-your-face references, like when Buzz's wings spring open in excitement when he sees Jesse the cowgirl opening the door for Andy's dog, and can you blame him? But then there's the toys Sid makes. If you don't remember Sid, you must be really good at suppressing traumatic memories, because my god was this guy scary. Not only was he just freaky, he did freaky things to his toys. He ripped their heads off and other pieces just to stitch them back together in a monstrous Frankenstein toy, one of which is simply just a pair of legs attached to a fishing rod. The toy is meant to be a play on the word for a woman of the night that starts with hook. Learned that today. Not to mention the massive amount of things that are poking out of underwear areas throughout movies like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. Seriously, Disney, you can try to hide it all you want, but you are thirsty, bud. Number nine, where's my mama? When it comes to Disney, the number of deceased or missing moms is insane. When you think about it, almost all of the iconic characters we know and love had no moms. Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Pocahontas, Cinderella, Bambi. Let's not forget how traumatic the first two minutes of Finding Nemo was. I never understood what happened to that mom as a kid. Spoiler alert, she's viciously eaten by a barracuda in front of her husband. Thanks, Disney. According to some inside sources close to the company's creator, Walt Disney, there was actually a reason for this. His own mother, Flora Disney, unexpectedly passed away after the animator bought her a house with his earnings from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Unfortunately, the house had a faulty furnace that they attempted to repair, but it had apparently been unsuccessful. It ultimately leaked and asphyxiated her. Walt felt personally responsible for the tragedy since he bought that house, so it seems like this has had a lasting impact on him, as up until the early 2000s, there were basically no Disney moms. So many dark backstories for characters that have not been explored. Honestly, I think Disney should just make a movie set in the afterlife starring all of the deceased moms. Not even like trying to come back to life or anything. Just like Nemo and Bambi's mom playing tennis or something. That would be cute. Number eight, The West Wing. Beauty and the Beast is one of the best Disney animated films ever created. It's beautiful, it's filled with catchy music, and all of the furniture is alive. First thing I need to point out here, if everything is alive and was once a person, does that mean that when they sit in chairs at the dining table that they're just like, on someone that that was a person and now your butt is rubbing against them. The darkest thing about this movie that they would prefer you to forget is of course the West Wing, where Belle is never allowed to venture. But eventually she does, and we see that the West Wing is filled with furniture and spider webs. Now while at first this isn't anything special, it is an old castle after all. Once you realize that the furniture is not moving and is actually like disintegrating, the dark truth is revealed. The chairs and cabinets were once staff members of the castle. Perhaps some 
some were a bit older than most when the curse originally took place, and this would mean that their final days were spent as an old table or a coffee cup. Seeing as they aren't bodies that you can bury, and you can't just leave them on the street for someone to take because that would be messed up, he just jammed the deceased staff members into a room and forgot about them. There are so many things in that room, I can only imagine what the West Wing must have looked like after the curse was lifted and people turned back into people. Oh, I can smell it. Ugh. Number 7, 1-800-ME. The Santa Claus is one of the most classic Christmas movies to ever be released by Disney Studios. However, the film did cause a little bit of an issue when it was first released. In the movie, a reference is included by Tim Allen in which he ad-libbed the number for a scene, and the number was 1-800-SLAP-MY-BEHIND. Okay, it actually wasn't that, I can't say the real number on here because you might call it, but just look it up. Because while this was a funny line at the time, it turns out that that was a real phone number that would connect you with a woman of the night, whose job was to verbally pleasure the caller for a small fee charged by the minute. Several youngsters reportedly dialed in and racked up massive phone charges for their parents not knowing what they were actually doing. Man, I feel bad for the dads in that situation. Honey, I swear it was the kids, I don't even know this number. Thanks to the massive amounts of complaints, Disney had to adjust the dialogue in the DVD release to be 1-800-POUND instead, which, I don't know, that's somehow worse. Pound is a very aggressive word. However, if you own a VHS copy of this movie, um, those are the black bricks with the little strips of film inside them that you sometimes see in thrift stores. The original dialogue is still there, so sorry Disney, you tried to hide this one and it failed, because I still have a VHS tape. Number six, Toy Story. The world of Pixar animated flicks already has cool theories, suggesting that every single computer animated movie released since Toy Story shares the same universe. That's right, like Cars, WALL-E, Monsters Inc., all of these exist in the same world, just in different places in time. However, it seems that this may extend beyond beyond the world of Pixar. During a scene in the first film of Toy Story, a pattern can be seen on the carpet beneath Woody and Buzz in Sid's house. That may be familiar to some eagle-eyed horror movie fans. The carpet in question shares the exact same pattern as one throughout the floors of the Overlook Hotel in the 1980 film adaptation of The Shining. The number 237 was also used several times during the third Toy Story installment, which was the number on the famous hotel room in the Overlook, housing one of the gnarly ghosts in the building. She still makes me uncomfortable today. The creator has exclaimed that he's a massive fan of the Shining universe, but he didn't confirm whether or not it shared the same world as Toy Story. But I don't know, the references were confirmed to be intentional and the evidence is clear. So perhaps we should keep an eye out for a Woody doll in the reboot of The Shining that I'm sure is in the works, because uh, what, what won't they remake now? Everything is being remade. Number 5, The Little Mermaid. Now this entry is very dark and it covers the topic of consent and some physical altercations, so if that upsets you at all, please skip to the next entry, there is no harm done. The Little Mermaid is a Disney classic, but when you think about it, it really shouldn't be. The film follows the story of a young mermaid who trades her voice to a sea witch for legs, so that she can exist among the humans. As soon as she gets onto the shore, she meets Prince Eric, who falls madly in love with her, despite her literally never saying any words. Throughout the movie, we see Eric taking her around the island and the castle and introducing her to the townspeople, and it's cute, but she never says anything. She just smiles and continues about her day. One of the most glaring issues with this film that Disney would prefer us to forget is that Prince Eric almost kissed Ariel without her consent. During the famous kiss the girl scene, the lyrics are essentially just Sebastian telling Eric, hey man, it's good to go, kiss Ariel, it's the right time, it's the right mood, let's make it happen. But she didn't say that was okay, Mr. Krabs. He never actually plants the kiss until later on when she gets her voice back, but Disney actually tried to bury this in the new Little Mermaid live action movie. They changed the lyrics to include Eric needing permission to kiss the girl. Try all you want, Disney. The live action movie is trash, and we are all going back to the OG for comfort. Number four, Anna and Elsa's brother. The movie Frozen introduced us to the iconic princess Elsa and her sister Anna. The first movie received massive success, but like many Disney projects, the first few minutes are just rough to watch. In the opening of the film, the king and queen set off on a boat across the ocean, where they disappear following a shipwreck. In the movie, we're led to believe that they pass away at sea, but it was revealed by the film's directors, Chris Buck and Jennifer Lee that they actually did survive the wreck and in fact washed up on shore of an island. Unbeknownst to them, the queen was pregnant with a little baby boy who was born on the island and left to fend for itself after the parents are mauled by a leopard. That's right, the truth behind the shipwreck in Frozen is that the princesses had a brother who grew up with apes and eventually became 
Tarzan. This is a really neat connection and the fans are excited to discover, but it means that Disney tried to hide the true, even more tragic story of what actually happened to their parents. They didn't just sink and that was it, no, they had to go and live a small life on an island and raise a child before they left the world. Like I know Disney can be dark, but that's just depressing. Number 3. The Fate of Villains Disney villains have often found themselves in some pretty rough situations. Thankfully at the end of the movie, most are either slain or they're locked away forever. But the early days of Disney included some dark fates. One of the most disturbing is that of the Lion King baddie Scar. While he definitely received his karma being eaten alive by a wild pack of hyena, it was revealed that the hyena must have been pretty careful because in the movie Hercules, Scar briefly appeared as a pelt that the titular Hercules was trying on. Okay, ew. So it's okay because it's Scar, but like what about all the other people who passed away in Disney movies? You know what? What happens to them? Scar being a pelt is just a hint to what might be going on behind the scenes. You know, like whatever did happen to his brother Mufasa after he fell? Did the same people that found Scar find him? Is there a pelt out there somewhere of the priest from the Hunchback of Notre Dame? I hope not. That dude needs to stay in the fire that they dropped him in. Here's my biggest question. What happened to Ursula's body after she's taken out at the end of The Little Mermaid? Hmm? She's like a hundred feet tall. Is there just a massive octopus carcass floating in the ocean now? They can try to hide it as much as they want, but if Scar can be a pelt, then the worst villain fates we can imagine, they're probably pretty accurate. Number 2. The Three Little Pigs Three Little Pigs is probably one of the most universally known children's stories to ever exist. Three pigs hiding from the big bad wolf who tries to blow their house down. As with most animated Disney classics, The Three Little Pigs is based on a much darker story. The story actually follows three pigs avenging the slaying of their father, because if you look on the back of the wall as the pigs play piano, there is a framed photo of a sausage, and it just says father underneath. The reason is in the original story, their dad is graphically stolen and turned into sausage links. The three pigs snap and they are now highly defensive of themselves and their homes. So when a wolf comes around trying to get its next meal, the pigs took action. In the Disney film, the three little pigs beat the wolf and he runs away never to be seen again. It's a very wholesome ending. The original story ends with the wolf crawling through the brick chimney only to be trapped in a boiling pot in a fireplace where he is cooked alive and eaten by the pigs. Yeah, can't put that in a kids movie. They did their best to hide the original tale behind a colorful and short little cartoon, but not only is there a sausage in a picture frame that says dad, but there's also a photo of their mom feeding seven pigs. So like, what happened to the other four? Huh? Can we get a prequel please? Prequel movie? Three Little Pigs Origins. And at number one, the blatant ra- Unfortunately, a large number of Disney movies were released during a time in America where concepts like ethnic or racial sensitivity and political correctness, they just didn't exist. As a result, Disney has done their best to keep their past hidden, but it's just not good enough. In fact, one movie was so bad that it was banned upon release and Disney could not physically release it to the public. And talk about that more in a minute. For now, let's talk about the movies that make us say, oh, oh, that's not cool. Dumbo from 1941. The elephant encounters a group of crows who have been identified as racist caricatures of African Americans. While their actual role in the film is kind of positive, they're like the only ones that actually help Dumbo, the way they speak, act, move, everything is just so obviously a stereotype. Another example is a terrible portrayal of Native Americans in the original Peter Pan cartoon, where they're literally drawn with red skin and they sing what is probably one of the most racist songs ever put in a Disney movie. You know the one. But that's not even close to the worst. The worst was a movie called Song of the South, which you may have never heard of because Disney actually never Never released it. The movie relied heavily on racial stereotypes and caricatures that has pegged it as the most offensive film ever put on tape. They tried to fix this by changing details in live action remakes, even closing down a ride at their theme park because it has some pretty nasty history behind it. Despite them trying to make us forget about what happened, we will never forget that scene in Peter Pan. Seriously, who animated that? Number 10. Alec is homophobic. Alec Baldwin is a proud man, being publicly anti-Trump and a registered Democrat with left-leaning political views. But despite his advocation for equality, he's been accused of being homophobic on multiple occasions. In June 2012, Alec released a very angry tweet, which he later deleted. It contained comments about the New York Daily News editor-in-chief, Colin Meyer, calling him an English queen. A year later, People Magazine reported that Baldwin
Baldwin released another tweet that the Daily Mail was a toxic little queen. Man, he loves that word. That same year, Alec was fired from his MSNBC talk show Up Late with Alec Baldwin after allegedly screaming homophobic slurs at a New York Post photographer. After his show was cancelled, Alec released an article that asked his fans, was he really homophobic? He went on to write, look, I'm in show business. I'm a wash in gay people as colleagues and friends. He then did the most defensive thing possible by listing all of his gay friends and then described a time when he had to kiss Russell Brand in a scene as a way to be like, hey, I kissed a dude. How could I be homophobic? Hey, man. You'd be surprised. He made the argument that he was a public advocate for gay marriage because he officiated a ceremony at one point. But like, hey man, you're an actor. It would make sense that he plays the role of a public advocate to keep his true biases a secret and maintain his career. Number 9. Alex Control Issues While his brothers may have had a more public battle with their substance control issues, Alec also had to battle his demons in the form of multiple narcotics and a taste for adult beverages. In his 2017 memoir, Nevertheless, Alec revealed that not only did he battle with control issues for years, but he also suffered from a nearly fatal overdose after a week-long battle of continuous partying. He wrote that he thinks he would have gotten sober eventually, but that the event was an early wake up call that he needed to get clean just before he turned 27. He describes his time before that as living in the white, hot period of daily substances and drinks, claiming the experience to be an addictive nightmare that was impossible to get a handle on. Eventually, he was able to get a grasp on his issues and has remained relatively sober ever since. Well, at least California sober at least. <laughs> wink, wink. Number eight. Alex Temper. In 2007, Alec directed his hot temper at his daughter, Ireland, who he had had with his ex-wife, Kim Bassinger, in a now infamous voicemail that would reveal the usual mild-mannered, soft-spoken man was secretly an angry man. TMZ obtained the audio of the message to Ireland in which Alex screams, You are a rude, thoughtless little pig. You don't have the brains or decency to be a human being. I don't care if you're a child or that your mother is the toughest pain in the butt. The perception that he may be verbally chastising his daughter came after claims that he was going to straighten her out, which led a family judge to bar Alec from seeing his child. While the family later reconciled in 2012, his daughter has said in recent interviews that the voicemail was never perceived by her as intense, as she was used to those kinds of verbal outbursts from her father. Um, just to anyone watching this right now that thinks screaming and breaking things is a normal reaction when you're upset, um, it's not. Please call someone or get help because it's not okay to act like that, especially towards your own flesh and blood. Seriously, if that's happening to you or someone you know, just call the number down below. Please talk to somebody and let your voice be heard. Number seven, Ireland's rehab stint. Alec Baldwin's daughter, named after his favorite place to pass out, isn't a party girl, but she certainly came close a few times. A source told Radar Online that Ireland was not considered to be an addict per se. She did drown her feelings in the spicy no no juice that adults just love to glug, though. In 2015, Ireland had to be hospitalized for severe stomach pains, which turned out to be a serious case of appendicitis. Despite it just being her appendix, the hospital visit had come after a roughly six month bender, and she reportedly told the hospital officials that she needed professional help. Baldwin then found herself checking into Soba Recovery Center in Malibu, California, which treats control issues for various substances, as well as any underlying psychological problems that may lead to them. She was quoted as claiming that she's not much of a party girl, but she needed to deal with some emotional emotional trauma and get some intense therapy to help her speed up her recovery. Thankfully, she progressed beautifully during her time at Soba, thanks to the support of her fellow Baldwinians, especially her mama Kim, who regularly sent her care packages from home with little notes and treats. Hey, got a problem with substance control issues? Eat a Snickers. Number 6. Steven is broke While he may not be as well known as his brother Alex, Steven Baldwin has been steadily working in Hollywood since his first appearance in a minor role alongside Tom Cruise in the 1989 film Born on the Fourth of July. He went on to star in several indie and medium budget flicks, like the 1995 thriller The Usual Suspects, the Flintstones prequel Viva Rock Vegas from 2000, and probably most famously the 1996 film Biodome, of which he got a little bit too excited about. You see, Biodome ended up being one of his most lucrative films, and between the first paycheck and the year 2012, he went completely broke. While he's had steady work in smaller roles over the years, appearing to be well off, the paychecks have not always been the biggest. In 2012, Steven was arrested for failing to file his taxes from 2008 to 2010, owing the state over $350,000 in back taxes. It turns out he just loved spending money on literally anything he wanted. Houses, boats, 
cars, all of this landing him over $2.3 million in personal debt. Following his arrest, Stephen pleaded guilty to tax evasion and was forced to pay back $300,000 immediately just to avoid any prison time. Recent reports say that he has moved into a small condo in New York after selling anything that may aid him in repaying the government. Hey, it only took him being arrested to realize that he should probably pay his taxes. Huh, how about that? Number 5. Stephen Can't Drive Alex baby bro Stephen Baldwin may have had massive financial woes over the years, but he's also been a bit of a bad boy behind the wheel. In 2014, Baldwin was busted for driving with a suspended license in New York City. He was reportedly carrying an expired registration form which he confidently handed to the police, expecting to be met with nothing but praise and excitement that it was Hollywood superstar Stephen Baldwin, oh my! Instead he was met with handcuffs, as not only was the car registration expired, but his driving was so erratic and insane that he was charged with aggravated, unlicensed operation of a motor vehicle, which is a misdemeanor, as well as driving an unregistered vehicle and driving with a suspended license. This was not the first incident involving his poor skills as a driver, however. A few years prior to that, he was also arrested for making an illegal U-turn. Well, he wasn't arrested for that. He was arrested because his license was beyond expire. In the end, though, we only had to pay a $75 fine that time, as the incident was a misunderstanding and his new license just so happened to appear the day after he was pulled over. Oh, well, that's not suspicious at all. Number 4. Daniel's Arrests The Baldwin family may consist of Hollywood heavyweights and minor league players, but did any of you know about Daniel Baldwin? Because, I, I don't know, I didn't. E! News reported that in 1997, Danny went on a no-no snow-fueled rampage at the famed New York Plaza Hotel, smashing every piece of furniture in sight and completely destroying his room. When police finally arrived following multiple noise complaints, Danny was in his birthday suit, bleeding and incoherent. He was taken to the hospital where he woke up in handcuffs. He later pleaded guilty to the charges of disorderly conduct and was sentenced to three months of rehabilitation to avoid any jail time. This family should have like a little punch card or something, you know? Four stints in rehab, get the fifth one free. The rehab didn't work, however, as in April 2006, Baldwin was arrested again for possession of no-no snow after another hotel incident, this time in Santa Monica, though charges were never actually pushed onto him. He later confessed to People Magazine that his control issues started at a party in 1989. Six months later, he went to rehab, but it never took. He blames his major relapses and arrests on his prescription for Vicodin, which was given to him following a back injury. From there, he spiraled into everything under the sun, probably including the sun itself. Maybe you can get a buzz from that thing if you look at it too long. N nope, nope, I'm just blind now. Number 3. Daniel's Love Life Daniel hasn't only been involved with drama when it comes to the police. He's also got a pretty poor taste in judgment when it comes to his relationships. He's been married three times and has five children with four different women. While his first marriage wasn't very public, his second one was chock full of scandal. He married actress Elizabeth Hitchler. Hitch. Lur in 1990 and divorced her six years later. During the same year, he had a son named Atticus with his Homicide Life on the Street co-star Isabella Hoffman. They had reportedly been involved for over a decade, including during Dan's time married to Elizabeth. It's his third marriage though when things got extreme. Baldwin met a woman named Joanne Smith in California at the rehab facility that he had been staying in. She was the chef and he was hungry. They married in 2007 and had two kids together. In 2011 though, Baldwin again filed for divorce, this time citing Joanne's substance control issues as the main cause. He also alleged that Smith had told Dan she was going to end his life in front of their children and was accused of being physical towards him on numerous occasions and would fall into violent rages. Police were even called to the house at one point and discovered that Smith was unfit to be around the kids and granted Daniel temporary custody and restraining order against her. Number two, Two, divided by politics. While Alec may be outspoken as a man against former President Donald Trump, even parodying him on the sketch show Saturday Night Live for a few seasons, his brother Stephen is the yin to his yang as he is a big time supporter of the Republican bad boy. The differences in their beliefs caused a massive rift in the family unit that the Baldwins fought hard to keep secret from the public eye. Unfortunately, Stephen couldn't keep his fingers off of his phone and he took to Twitter to have a public feud with his brother Billy Baldwin, who was also anti-Trump. 
argument ranged from I'm right, you're wrong, to Dad would be rolling over in his grave right now if he heard you say that. In 2017, Steven admitted to Hollywood reporters that he hadn't spoken to his brother Alec in over a year following the dispute. Steven's daughter Haley Bieber confirmed that even within her immediate family unit, politics caused a lot of issues when Trump was elected. Now that he's out of office and on the verge of jail time, we have to imagine that the Baldwin family are just anxiously beating their heads on the wall like, what is gonna happen? And at number one, Alec doesn't play by the rules. Alec always presents a calm and soft-spoken demeanor when he's in interviews or interacting with fans. But in his mind, the rules of common society just don't apply to him. A little while back, Alec was kicked off of an American Airlines flight after he refused to turn off his cell phone when the crew asked him to. According to Alec himself, he was playing a game of word with friends when the situation took place. Now he posted on Twitter, flight attendant on American reamed me out for playing words with friends while we sat at the gate not moving. No wonder American is bankrupt. American Airlines themselves denied the notion that they took the situation too far, claiming that Alec was extremely rude and calling the crew inappropriate names and using offensive language the moment he got on the plane. He later continued his journey on another American Air flight and tweeted that the new crew had already looked smarter than the last one, making it sound like it's not a smart idea to upset him or something. I don't know. What are you gonna do, Alec? Huh? Come get me. Coming at number 10, we have Kim Kardashian. The theme for the 2022 to Met Gala was gilded glamour. And for Kim Kardashian, this meant wearing one of Marilyn Monroe's dresses, which happened to be the dress that Marilyn wore when she sang happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy. Then later there would be conflicting reports that started to headline the media as they claimed that she damaged the dress that she only wore on the red carpet because it didn't fit her correctly. And then she changed into a replica dress inside the event, which led us all to question why did she have to wear the original to begin with? While Ripley's did claim that the dress was damaged before Beforehand, and Kim never damaged the iconic gown before and after photos would prove otherwise. Not to mention, she also repeatedly bragged about her weight loss to fit into the garment. In the end, Moreau's fans were extremely upset that the fact Kim used part of the late star's legacy for this and historic preservationist even were upset that the dress was damaged and critics of diet culture were angry about Kim's harmful dieting tips. Number 9. Kendall Jenner It's clear that Kendall is not someone who spends most of her time in the kitchen. During an episode from her family's new TV series, The Kardashians, the star would expose herself after she proved that she's probably never used a knife to cut her own vegetables a day in her life. In a now viral clip, Kendall could be seen in the kitchen wanting to make herself a snack in front of her mother, Kris Jenner, who awkwardly sat there dumbfounded when Kendall attempted to navigate what most can do before they're even a legal adult. At one point, you can even see Kris was concerned concern for her daughter's fingers when she cautiously watched before saying, do you want the chef to make you a snack? Instead of holding the knife with her dominant hand and the cucumber in her other, the model reached her arm over the knife to grip the opposite side of the vegetable and then proceeded to cut inward, directing the slices to fall towards herself. While most would chuckle at an offer of professional hired chef being called in to simply chop up a cucumber for a 26 year old woman. After witnessing Kendall attempt to do it on her own, it was pretty sad. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Number 8, Doja Cat. So do you remember the time when Doja Cat slid into Noah Schnapp's DMs just after season 4 of the hit Netflix series Stranger Things was released? While many of us were crushing on Joseph Quinn who played Eddie Munson, it appears that Doja Cat wanted to get him before anyone else did, so she decided the best way to do it was to slide into the DMs of Joseph's co-star, Noah Schnapp, to see if Joseph was single and then proceeded to ask Noah to send her a link on his Instagram. The internet then began to rage as Noah is still considered a child and Doja is a full grown woman. Noah then responded by sending Doja the link and then he decided it was too weird so he read the DMs out loud for his TikTok fans to hear. In the end, Doja Cat would then be furious that Noah decided to expose her and described his actions as him being a borderline snake. Eventually, Noah did have a good laugh and he did apologize to Doja Cat for exposing the video and then he went on to delete the video. But not before the internet called out Doja Cat for being 29 years old and messaging a 17 year old. Like, come on, Chrissy, just wake up and realize that wasn't okay. Number seven, Adam. 
Adam Levine. Back in September, Adam Levine would be plastered all over the headlines after model Sumner Stroff exposed Adam Levine in a series of shocking TikTok videos. Just shortly after Adam and his wife announced they were expecting their third child. In the video, Sumner would claim that she and Adam had an affair and she even provided screenshots of their conversations as proof so people knew she wasn't lying. In the beginning, Adam would then try to deny the affair and he took to his Instagram to write a statement which said, I use poor judgment in speaking with anyone other than my wife in any kind of flirtatious matter. I've not had an affair, nevertheless, I crossed the line during a regrettable period of my life. Sumner clearly wasn't happy with Adam's statement and then she came out with another TikTok video to claim Adam even asked her if it was okay to name his unborn child after her. And she urged for someone to get him a dictionary so he could look up the definition of cheating. Number six, Ned Fulmer. Adding to the storm of cheating scandals on September 27th, the internet content creators known as the Try Guys would announce that one of the members who happens to be Ned Fulmer would be leaving the groups following reports that Ned had an affair with one of his employees, Alex Herring, after a Reddit user shared now deleted screenshots of a video that appeared to feature Ned making out with the Try Guys associate producer at a bar in New York City. As the clip started to circulate around the internet, more videos and photos would also start to circulate of Alex and Ned on dates that looked pretty intimate and people who posted the images even said they sent them to his wife because they were concerned. This would then force the Try Guys to post a statement which said Ned was no longer working with the Try Guys as a result of a thorough internal review. We do not see a path moving forward together. Soon after the announcement, the Try Guys even switched out their profile picture of all four members with the company's official logo across Instagram and Twitter before making an additional video statement clarify that they were blindsided by the news of Ned's behavior. Number five, Will Smith. At the Oscars on March 27, 2022, Will Smith would show us all that there was something concerning going on with his mental health and state of being as he exposed his darker side. During Chris Rock's speech, he would opt to make an inappropriate joke about Jada Pinkett's shaved head. The joke clearly didn't sit well with Will as Jada has been suffering from a condition called alopecia. So he took to the stage and smacked Rock across the face. As producers scrambled backstage, Smith would return to his seat and remain there until he accepted his award for best actor for his role in the film King Richard. The internet would then start to explode with their opinions on the matter, and while the Smith family mostly stayed offline, well, except for Jada, the Academy would end up banning Will from attending the ceremony for 10 years, though he can still be nominated and win an Oscar. After the ceremony, Will would make an official apology to Chris, and he would then enter into a rehabilitation facility to help him work on his mental health. Number four, Sydney Sweeney. On August 27th, Sydney Sweeney would take to her Instagram to post some images of her mother Lisa's western themed 60th birthday celebration and would expose her family with photos that showed some of the relatives wearing Make America Great Again hats and Blue Lives Matter t-shirts. While the actress did not appear to make any political statements herself, while most people started to go crazy in the actor's comments, one person claiming that the actress exposed her family's political views, another asked why she was kicking it with people wearing blue Lives Matter merch. Sydney would then later come out to say, you guys, this is wild. An innocent celebration for my mom's milestone 60th birthday party has turned into an absurd political statement, which was not the intention. Please stop making assumptions. Much love to everyone and happy birthday mom. However, you can't really ask your fans to stop making assumptions when there's nothing really to assume. And no matter what the occasion is, it's never okay to wear any of this merchandise items. And each of her family was wearing wearing these because it was a country themed party but hate isn't country. Number three, Kris Jenner. Roughly six months after Kanye West's feud with his ex-wife Kim Kardashian started, in September, Kanye would go after the reality TV star, and this time, he would drag Kris Jenner into things and confirm that she was really the one who released Kim's tape. After Kanye hopped back onto his platform after months of disappearing, he would share several explosive messages towards Kim, and in the process, he would express his disapproval towards Kim's parenting styles 
as he accused her of playing games with their four children. In Kanye's post, he would also claim that he wanted to take control over his kids in their future by declaring, My kids are going to Donda. They are not going to Sierra Cannon. For telling Chris to grab her mother effing popcorn. Things would then take another turn when Kanye started to point out that Chris Jenner encourages her daughters, mainly Kim and Kylie, to appear in adult magazines and release their infamous tapes, as he was scared Chris would make his own kids participate in the same endeavors in the future. Number two, Amber Heard. 2022 was a big year for Amber Heard, as it would be the year the star would crash and burn after all of her lies were exposed. While Amber was hoping her dark past wouldn't catch up to her, it certainly did, and when her biggest secret was exposed after she tried to ruin Johnny Depp's career, while Amber was trying to claim that she was a public figure representing domestic abuse. However, during one point of the trial, Amber's lawyer, Ben Rottenborn, presented his opening statements where he presented a Milani Cosmetics all-in-one correcting kit to the jury and claimed that Amber had used this very concealer and correcting kit to hide and cover her bruises. However, that makeup brand wasn't even out, and it exposed Amber's lies by saying in a statement it couldn't be true because their product wasn't even available until after Amber and Johnny had gotten a divorce. In the statement, Ben said this is what she used. She became very adept at it. Amber and Johnny got divorced in 2016 which was before Milani's Cosmetic even launched that specific product as it didn't come out until 2017, which means Amber lied. Number one, Olivia Wilde. For months, the headlines have been filled with an alleged on-set feud between Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh. On set of Olivia's film, Don't Worry Darling, and rumors didn't paint Olivia to be as charming or sweet as we were all led to believe in the past. Despite much of the cast attempts to dampen the rumors, the tension between the two were apparently so bad that some crew members even started to claim that they had a screaming match on set. And Olivia's former nanny would even say that apparently in the beginning, Florence and Harry were close and it drove Olivia nuts. And she complained to her fiance, Jason Sudeikis. And then when she left Jason for Harry and kept taking Harry away from set, this drove Florence nuts. And then Olivia got into a feud with Shia LaBeouf before hiring Harry Styles to replace him. And she claimed that she fired Shy to keep Florence safe, but then Shy would release their text messages where you could see Olivia making fun of Florence, and you can also see why Shy quit because he was done with Olivia's nonsense. Coming in at number 10, we have Corey Monteith's substance struggles. According to Frederick Robertson, during the early Glee days, Corey Monteith was really concerned about maintaining a clean image. When he got the role, he knew he was supposed to be a good kid, and he didn't want his past getting out. With Glee being the beginning of his success, he didn't didn't want the world to know that he was struggling with alcohol and substances. While his struggles may have been kept a secret to the public, Corey had no problem with disclosing them to his close friends and roommate, Justin Neal. In 2008, Corey would admit to Justin about his substance use in the past and that he was trying to stay sober as it was a big part of his life. According to the docu-series, Corey started skipping school to do substances at the age of 13 and he went on to attend a dozen schools, including programs for troubled teens and often stole large sums of cash from his family. At the age of 19, his mother and friends staged an intervention, leading him to enter into a rehab program in 2001. It wasn't until Glee's second season that he went public with his struggles, admitting in an interview that he wanted to share his past so people didn't assume he was exactly like his all-star character, Finn Hudson, by saying, I feel like I had to step in at some point and relate to people with my experience and where I come from. Corey's publicist, Leslie Diana, also said he wanted to go public to help others as Corey wanted to show them that you could come out on the other side and do well in life. Number 9, Corey and Leah's relationship. Lee stars Leah Michelle and Corey Monteith didn't go public with their relationship until 2012, but according to Garrett Greer, an assistant to the executive producer on seasons 1 and 2, they first got together years earlier in 2009. He would go on to say they had been an item before the show premiered and during season 1 or part of it anyway, Leah and Corey were involved and and then later, the relationship came back 
physical force. Later, Garrett would go on to describe Leah as a narcissist, and then would go on to note that the other members on the Glee set also didn't think they were a good match. Even the set decorator, Barbara Munch, would make a comment about the relationship when she said, It seemed odd because it was about her always, and I think he just accepted that. Doug Kirkpatrick, head of hair department in season three, would also go on to say that Corey and Leah's relationship also had a negative side effect on Corey's mental state. And he said, A lot of Corey's confusion had a lot to do with his relationship with Leah Michelle. I don't know if she was a friend. I think she was involved with him because he was on a TV show. Patrick Chinzel, a key assistant location member, would also ask the ultimate question if that Leah was good for Corey. And then he would go on to say, I hope so. I would think so. I know other people who say maybe. That wasn't necessarily true. It seems like people didn't really understand why Corey was dating Leah, and many felt like she wasn't good enough for him. Hey, my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming in at number eight, we have Naya Rivera and Leah Michelle's hated each other. If you were a fan of Glee or you watched just one episode, then you would know it's no secret that Naya, who played cheerleader Santana, and Leah, who played the dorky Glee girl no one liked, Michelle, were at odds most of the time, but you may not know they were at odds in real life as well. Naya herself, who passed away in an accident while she was boning in 2020, wrote about the friction in her 2016 memoir, Sorry Not Sorry, and would write, One of the Glee writers said that Leah and I were like two sides of the same battery, and that about sums up. Us up. We are both strong willed and competitive, not with each other, but everyone. And that's not a good mixture. In the documentary, Naya's father, George, spoke of the pair's rivalry and he would say there was always a fight between them. Always. Everybody knew, everybody saw it. They hated each other, but at the same time respected each other's talent. George would also note that Naya even complained about Leah to production and it would cause Naya to be briefly let go from the cast. Number seven, Naya Rivera's dad's warning. Naya Rivera's dad, George, recalled the last time he spoke to his daughter, which happened to be via FaceTime shortly before she passed away. George would go on to say, I get a sinking feeling because we've been boating forever. I was on FaceTime with her, trying to talk her through the pitfalls. First of all, I said, Naya, you're on a platoon boat. That's not a boat. Why are you on a platoon boat? I said, do not jump off that effing boat. If you got an anchor, you can anchor it, but do you know how to anchor it? We went through a couple of interactions like that, and then the FaceTime call hung up, and that was the last time I talked to her. After he received a call from authorities about his daughter, George would begin a multi-day drive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Ventura County, California, but even though he considered his daughter was a really good swimmer, he instinctively feared the worst by saying, I knew immediately when I got the phone call in Knoxville that it was over. You don't find a drifting five-year-old child asleep on the boat at the end of the lake without his mother and have any hope. I had no hope. And speaking about his grief, he would also say, you don't process it. I don't know what everyone else does, but for me, it's as fresh today as it was two years ago. He would also later add that Naya knew she was on a really good show with lots of tragedies and that he didn't know if you could equate that to fame, but he thought it had something to do with it. Number Number six, fame. Corey Monte's former roommate, Neil, said that Corey struggled with fame as Glee's popularity skyrocketed and the show's fandom intensified by saying there was a period where it seemed Corey was getting more and more isolated. He just got to the point where he just hated fame. He said, I'm just so tired, I want to rest a bit, I'm sick of singing these songs, and I remember him specifically saying, I wouldn't wish fame on my worst enemy. Neil then continued to say, I'd seen the fame, but I didn't realize how hard it was until then. I think with that level of fame, you lose sight of who you are to every single person. He wasn't Corey anymore, he was now Finn. We just knew he wasn't in the best place. Neil would also add in the second episode, in the documentary The Price of Glee, that Corey became frustrated with Glee's demanding schedule and wanted more freedom with his career as he had to turn down movies and he was becoming more erotic and isolated. However, Neil did know as much as he didn't like fame, he knew how lucky he was and never took that for granted. Number five, the competitive cast. The cast members in Glee were all relatively unknown before they appeared on the show. And as they begun to become a household name, their social media pages 
also started to take off. As Glee increased popularity, so did its stars. When the cast members' social media began to rise, they were all poised to dominate emerging platforms, but their competition wasn't always friendly according to the docu-series commentators. Doug Kirkpatrick, who was head of the hair department in season 3, would note that he would often see the actors gathered talking about how many people they acquired as followers and that it quickly became a competition. He would also say, in the beginning, they had to tweet every day and it was Leah who really had the numbers. Journalist Andy Swift would also note that the actors started competing on their social media pages and they almost began to fight about it immediately. So it must have hurt a lot knowing that even in real life they would be in superior to Leah Michelle. Number 4. Peer Pressure One of the most controversial allegations in the documentary hinted that Corey Monteith was sober before his passing but that a co-star encouraged him to drink and it went downhill from there. In the documentary, hair department head Doug Kirkpatrick recalled one of the final times he saw Corey in the troubling story, the actor allegedly told him. Doug would say he wasn't drinking, he didn't have any substances in his system, and then the very last couple of days I saw him, he was different. He was under the influence of alcohol, he said he was at a party, he hadn't been drinking, he wanted to have a drink but knew he shouldn't, and he was told by a certain cast member that same night, you know, if you want to have a drink, you should have a drink. I'll be here for you. You can always trust that I'll be here for you. Doug also would go on to add his opinion by saying, in my opinion, you would never say that to someone who is sober and so that confused him and kind of made him mad and he started drinking because he was given permission by somebody. While Doug did refuse to mention any names, he would choose to keep the alleged Glee member a secret because he wasn't there when it happened and he didn't hear the Glee member say it in person himself. However, Doug would add that Corey resented it but also took the direction and that he believes this is the moment that sent him on the path to self-destruction. Mark Salling was largely unknown before he landed the role as Noah Puck Puckerman, who was Finn's best friend and like Corey, he was a bit older than the rest of the cast. At the time, it has been said that both Mark and Corey were 26 when Glee premiered. But according to Munch, Salling's age wasn't the only thing that made him stand out among his co-stars. Munch would say he was quieter, for sure, and kept to himself because I think he felt more of an adult than the others. Just was, you know, a bit off and he wasn't just a regular young man. He had some issues going on, it seemed obvious. Then a few months after, after Glee ended its sixth season run in 2015, Salling was arrested for possession of illegal photos and videos that contained younger people on them, a charge he ultimately pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. He then took his own life on January 30th, 2018, shortly before he was scheduled to be sentenced. Even Glee director of photography Christopher Baffa from seasons 1 to 3 would say Salling's offset behavior didn't jive the person he experienced, but he acknowledged that actors are typically on their best behavior once they get around the crew. How did he get there? He was a great guy. What happened? I don't know. Number 2. Forced Return While creator Ryan Murphy now believes Glee should have ended after Corey's passing, at the time he largely left the decision up to Leah Michelle. With various options on the table including a 6 month hiatus or cancelling the show altogether, Leah chose to return to work just 2 weeks after her boyfriend and co-star's passing. Back in 2013, Leah would tell Ellen, I said we have to go back to work, we have to, they're my family. However, many of the cast members interviewed in the docuseries were not supportive of this call. Jody Tanka said, it was only a couple of weeks, all of the actors had just pulled themselves together to get back to work. Everyone was kind of forced to. J.A. Byerly, a rigging gaffer on seasons 1 to 5, said Fox was conscious that Glee was about to cross the 100 episode mark. The traditional threshold for ultra profitable. They wanted a product, so we spit out a project. They were looking for 100 episodes. In October 2013, Glee paid tribute to Corey in The Quarterback, the third episode of season 5, and the episode follows the members of the Glee Club as they cope with their grief in the wake of Finn's passing. Honoring his memory with emotional performances of songs from season, from season of Love, If I Die Young, and Make You Feel My Love. Glee ultimately went on for two more seasons after Corey's passing, but Briarly says he was never far from the cast and crew's minds, and you could always feel an emptiness because Corey wasn't around anymore. And coming in at number one today, we have the Glee Curse. Over the past few years, there's been much talk about the Glee Curse, but the cast seemed to reject this theory. Kyle Birch would say, I remember someone mentioning the Glee curse to one of the cast members and they got pretty upset about it because they were like, no, this show is not 
cursed. There is no Glee curse. Eric Greer would add that bad things happen, it's life, and unfortunately with Glee there was more tragedy than any other show, but not everything can be full with sunshine and rainbows. Christopher Baffa would also add that ultimately, those close to Glee want the show to be remembered for spreading inclusivity and positivity, not tragedy. He would also say, I don't think Glee is ever going to outlive the tragedies of some of the cast tensions or some of the things that were said about it. But I'd hate to have those aspects as real as they are take away from the good that was achieved because I do believe that good was achieved. Number 10, iCarly Stunt Double. If you want to know something that proves the people at Nickelodeon only care about money, I've got a scandal for you that was almost swept under the rug entirely. In 2014, a stunt woman from iCarly claimed that the production ruined her career by recklessly dropping her from far too high above the ground, causing some really gruesome injuries. In a stunt gone wrong, Katina Waters was supposed to be dropped slowly down from the ceiling for an episode of iCarly in 2011. She was supposed to be slowly lowered to the ground while still attached to a wire. Instead, she claims that the person operating the descender machine dropped her without warning and she crashed to the floor. The medical consequences of the incident were pretty horrific. It caused severe injuries to her leg, including fractured bones and torn ligaments. But the long-term effects on her health were even worse for her career. Waters was a highly successful stunt actor who performed in dozens of TV shows and movies, but of course she missed out on a lot of work following the incident. Subsequently, she decided to sue the producer, Schneider's Bakery, plus Nickelodeon and MTV Networks for pain, suffering and loss of earnings. And she made the right decision as it later emerged that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened on the show. Number 9. The Gack After seeing countless celebrities being slimed on TV for years, there was an extremely high demand for Nickelodeon to release their iconic gooey green sludge to the public. This led the network to release what they called Gack into toy stores across the country in 1992, much to the delight of 90s kids everywhere. The product wasn't exactly slime that they had on the Nick shows, it was more like a squishy putty that made funny noises when you pressed it between your hands. Kids also loved the name Gack because not only was it onomatopoeia, but it also just sounded like how the product felt. However, the branding turned out to be a highly controversial decision, as the name itself was common street lingo for illicit street substances. In fact, it was literally a term for the substance that goes onto a spoon. The story goes that while someone on the Nick crew was working with the then nameless slime one day, they nicknamed it Gak, which became a naughty inside joke on set because of its meaning. Game show host Mark Summers was in on the joke too, and eventually started saying it live on air, but Nickelodeon's Mark marketing department allegedly had no idea and just cluelessly went along with it. Number 8. The Voice of Dora The network had a really big mess on their hands when Caitlin Sanchez, the teenager who starred on Dora the Explorer until she reached puberty, alleged that when she made the deal with Nickelodeon to voice the iconic character, she was given just 22 minutes to sign the contract without an experienced lawyer. The young star did so under duress, with the alleged promise that she'd receive residuals for her work, plus money from merchandising. This was in 2007, years before Dora the Explorer was established as an $11 billion global brand. So in 2010, Caitlin sued Nickelodeon and MTV networks for making her sign what she believed was a terrible contract that conned her out of millions, specifically citing unpaid work hours as well as being paid only $40 for promotional appearances. The legal battle made headlines throughout the world thanks to statements made by Caitlin's attorney that if Nickelodeon refuses to pay up by a certain date, he would expose their humiliating secrets. But the young voice actor ended up settling for $500,000, but then tried to re-sue because she and her family thought that the lawyer acted fraudulently and didn't tell her that most of the settlement would be eaten by taxes and lawyer fees. But to fans, the whole settlement just proved that the network certainly had something to hide. Number 7. Chris Savino Once it was exposed, the massive scandal that was a PR nightmare for Nickelodeon was akin to the network's own version of Harvey Weinstein. In 2017, Nick was forced to fire one of its most prominent showrunners, Chris Savino, over allegations made by at least a dozen women. Savino, who has been in the business since the early 90s, previously worked on such animated shows as Dexter's Laboratory and The Powerpuff Girls, and was the creator of Nick's second highest rated kids show at the time, Loud House, which centers on a boy's life while dealing with a house full of sisters. According to Cartoon Brew, as many as 12 women came forward to accuse 
to Savino of predatory behavior, including unwanted sexual advances and threats of blacklisting after the relationships with co workers had ended. What's even more disturbing is that the site said that the reports date back at least a decade. One woman said that she didn't accept an offer to work at Nickelodeon simply because Savino worked there. She alleged that when they both worked for Disney, he sent her explicit text messages and photos and once offered her a job in exchange for inappropriate things. And Walker Farrell, the director of Bojack Horseman, also came forward with her own Savino horror story from the early 2000s when both of them worked at Cartoon Network. Just goes to show you how cases involving power and inappropriate behavior infect almost every corner of Hollywood. Number 6, Zoe 101. The show was a boarding school set dramedy that hit Nickelodeon in January of 2005. Starring as protagonist Zoe Brooks, Jamie Lynn Spears was reportedly brought on by its creator Dan Schneider, all because she looked a lot like her older sister and superstar Britney Spears. But little did fans know there was actually a scandal brewing behind the set as its star was just 16 when she fell pregnant, which would have been a bombshell for the very PG show. In her memoir, Things I Should Have Said, Jamie Lynn Spears confessed that her team decided that her pop star sister should not be told about her pregnancy because it was too risky. Quote, the entire Spears team was already caught up in my sister's PR difficulties, and everyone around me just wanted to make this issue disappear. From there, her family and management pulled her out of school until they could figure out what to do next, and even took away her phone for fear that the news would get out. As a result, the actress said that even her father stopped talking to her. But once the news was released, Nickelodeon immediately released a statement saying, We respect Jamie Lynn's decision to take responsibility in this sensitive and personal situation. And after wrapping shooting for the fourth season of Zoe 101, the network cancelled the series altogether. Number 5, Jason Biggs. In the early seasons of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon, Jason Biggs could be heard voicing lead turtle Leonardo, but scandal quickly erupted at the network when it was revealed that his social media activity was offensive enough that there were many calls to Nickelodeon to protest his involvement with the show. So in 2014, after only two seasons, he was ultimately replaced by Seth Green on the popular series, and for a good reason. Jason's Twitter in the 2010s was a PR nightmare. In fact, there didn't seem to be any topic too controversial for him to joke about, like a bachelorette contestant who died, a plane crash, the Pope, women's basketball, and sexually explicit comments about the politician Paul Ryan's wife. But the jokes backfired big time when the official Ninja Turtles Twitter account gave a shout out to Jason's personal account and encouraged their followers to check it out. It's safe to say that the kid-friendly and PG Network is not pleased with the immense backlash that they started receiving from parenting groups and conservative bloggers, eventually leading them to release a statement apologizing, while Fox News host Megyn Kelly called the American Pie actor a disgusting pig and called for him to be fired. Ultimately, the network responded to the pressure and gave Jason the boot. Number 4, Angelique Bates. The actress who was one of the original cast members on Nick's sketch comedy show All That exposed the reality behind the cameras when she spoke to The Shade Room in 2016. Angelique explains some of the horrors she endured such as physical, emotional and mental mistreatment from her mother in front of producers who not only turned the other cheek but strongly urged her to just accept the violence and remain silent. She said that she was only 12 years old when the nightmare began and that the producers and cast members could hear her yelling but nothing was done to help her. According to Angelique, Child Protective Services did eventually show up in 1996 but she said that the adults on set pressured her to stay silent. Possibly in an attempt to muddy the waters or save her own skin, Angelique's mother Dee Bates came forward in support of her daughter, although she tried to shift the blame onto the network. Whatever the case with her mother's questionable side of the story, the former child star also explained that she was pretty much released from her contract at age 15 and claimed that she was blackballed by the entertainment industry as a result. But to this day, Nickelodeon have never come forward with an official response to the accusations. Number three, Victorious. Canadian actor Avon Jogia had his breakthrough role playing Beck Oliver in Victorious. But after Jeanette McCurdy's bombshell allegations regarding Dan Schneider, fans really started to question whether or not he had the 
same experience. In a recent TikTok video, Avan admitted that he did not actually remember filming the series at all because he was blackout drunk almost every night. Quote, when you don't remember a single plot line to a single victorious episode, but you do remember going out partying every night. When one fan added that the show seemed like a fever dream to her, Avan just said, me too, and I was there. And when another fan asked, so Beck was hungover all the time, he just said yes. This admission was significant because in Jeanette's new memoir, she talks about the creator pressuring her to drink while she was underage, allegedly saying, quote, the victorious kids get drunk all the time. The iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge. Sometime later, she claims that Schneider got into trouble with Nickelodeon for inappropriate behavior with the young cast and was not allowed to be near the actors anymore, meaning that he had to direct them from a separate control room. So it's entirely possible that he was creeping on more than just one actor. Number two, Jeanette McCurdy. The iCarly star recently released her new memoir, which has been described as both heartbreaking and hilarious. The blunt title, I'm Glad My Mom Died, shocked fans upon its release because it reveals what really went on behind the cameras, something that up until now, fans have only been able to really speculate about. Jeanette exposed her traumatic experiences on Nick and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother, who pushed her to be a child star, noting that her own persona that she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was all a front forced upon her by her mom, who in addition to everything else was extremely physically inappropriate with her. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed an eating disorder as a child and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also goes into great detail of numerous instances where she felt exploited as an actor both on and off set, describing the creator as mean-spirited, controlling and terrifying. The former Nick star recalled a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one-piece swimsuit, which she was much more comfortable with. Number one, Drake and Josh. This show was one of the most popular shows on Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. Starring Drake Bell and Josh Peck, the sitcom was one of the network's most successful projects from that time. So when the truth finally came out, fans were understandably left disillusioned and upset. Nobody knew that behind the scenes, Josh heavily struggled with addiction. Looking to feel better about himself, the actor explained in an interview that he lost a hundred and 27 pounds in an 18 month time span while filming the show. But when that didn't bring him happiness, he admitted that he turned to alcohol and illicit substances for help. But that was nothing compared to the revelation that his co-star was caught grooming young fans. In July of 2021, Drake Bell pled guilty to attempted endangering of children and disseminating harmful materials to juveniles after a young woman came forward and accused him of predatory behavior. The 19 year old who chose to remain anonymous claimed that he began talking to her when she was 12. The actor managed to get away with two years on probation and 200 hours of community service. But at 36 years old, Drake Bell's reputation is now irreparably tarnished. Number 10, Portia de Rossi. In her 2010 groundbreaking memoir, Unbearable Lightness, Portia de Rossi reveals the pain and illness that haunted her for decades. From a time she was a 12 year old girl working as a model in Australia through her early rise to fame as a cast member of of the hit television show Ally McBeal. She also detailed her struggles with and while living in the public eye and recounted how she survived on 300 calories a day and took 20 laxatives daily, trying to maintain a weight of 82 pounds. According to her memoir, Portia both starved herself and putting her life in danger and concealing from herself and everyone around her the seriousness of her illness and described the elaborate rituals around food that came to dominate hours of every day. The actress did this all while terrified that the truth of her sexuality would be exposed in the tabloids and revealed the heartache and fear that comes from living a life in the closet, which was only magnified by her unrelenting desire to be thinner, more in control of her body and the number of calories she consumed and spent. But it it wasn't all bad. Portia also recounted how falling in love with Ellen DeGeneres helped her develop a healthy body image, embrace her sexual orientation, and gain inner peace. Number nine, Janice Dickinson. A strange encounter with Bill Cosby in 1982 was described in the 2002 memoir No Lifeguard on Duty by the self anointed world's first supermodel, Janice Dickinson. In her book, she reveals real moments that she experienced with Cosby and goes into great detail when it comes to taking back the narrative. Janice 
Jess mentioned how Cosby allegedly answered his hotel room door in nothing but a towel and kissed her. He then took her to dinner and suggested that she follow him back upstairs. The memoir was pretty explosive at the time and would come back into relevance in 2018 when she chose to testify in court to Cosby's crimes. The comedian was once known to millions as America's dad, famous for his clean brand of family comedy and his award winning work with children's programming. So Janice's memoir really did help expose Cosby's double life, as eventually more than 50 women came out claiming that the star slipped them illicit substances and took advantage of them while they were unconscious. And in April of 2018, an 80 year old Cosby was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in prison, although he would eventually be released in 2021. Number 8. Corey Feldman In his deeply personal 2013 memoir, child star and teen heartthrob Corey Feldman exposes the darkness that loomed behind his rise to fame. Although he undoubtedly had a successful career, famous friendships and high profile relationships, Corey reveals a side to his star studded life that no one knew about and it's full of tragedy. He came from a broken family that he emancipated himself from at the age of 15. As a teenager, he suffered physical, emotional and sexual violence. The Stand By Me star was also arrested and struggled with addiction throughout his time as a successful working actor. But most shockingly, Corey also implied that his close friend Corey Haim's lifelong battle with addiction was the result of being preyed upon by a powerful older man. Following the book's publication came rampant speculations about the identity of the offender and it's something that readers still argue about to this day. His memoir Choreography weaves a heartbreaking story of pain and survival that reveals just how dark the industry can really be. Number 7 Holly Madison Former Playboy Bunny and Girls Next Door star Holly Madison dished on how oppressive life with Hugh Hefner really was in 2015's Down the Rabbit Hole. Madison described the many bizarre rules and rituals that Hefner imposed upon his girlfriends. For instance, that they needed to wear matching flannel pajamas, engage in a group dressed in tiny skirts and bralettes and had a daily curfew of 9pm. The memoir tells the story of Madison's time with Hefner from 2001 to 2008 and its aftermath. She goes into great detail about the reality of her life behind the cameras, how her depression in the Playboy Mansion reached harrowing depths, yet she felt trapped there. She also opened up about her unwillingness to admit to anyone how sad she really was and Hefner's emotional control over her. The book also explores her time on the reality show The Girls Next Door and the weirdness that was pop culture in the early 2000s. When speaking about her book, Holly said, quote, I felt like I had something to say about being in the midst of that whole thing that was going on where Paris Hilton and Jessica Simpson and Kendra were so celebrated and I was a part of it too for being dumb on TV. Part of the reason I wanted to write the book was to show the other side of it, which goes to show you just how much of it was all for the cameras. Number 6 Shania Twain The Grammy winning country singer confronted her childhood demons when she wrote her 2011 memoir From This Moment On, describing how her stepfather Jerry was physically, sexually and verbally violent towards her and her mother Sharon. In a frank and often shocking autobiography, the singer reveals graphic and personal details about her rags to riches story and the price of ambition and success. Throughout her memoir, it also became clear that Shania experienced a harrowing degree of poverty and hunger. For instance, she claimed that sometimes there was only bread and mustard for her and her four siblings to eat and they often wore plastic bread bags to cover their shoes to protect their feet during winter and regularly went to school without lunch. The singer also had to deal with a double betrayal in her life. She wrote about the heartache that she went through when she found out about the affair between her husband of 14 years, Robert Lang, and her best friend. As a result, Shania became so distraught that she literally lost her voice to spasmodic dysphonia which left her unable to sing. So her memoir explores how she worked through all that heartbreak. Number 5 Sharon Stone She became a Hollywood icon and a household name after her role in Basic Instinct and in a 2021 memoir, The Beauty of Living Twice, she finally revealed the vulnerability behind her femme fatale persona. She goes into great detail about her experiences in Hollywood, like how she was tricked into that famous shot in Basic Instinct and ill equipped for fame when it finally came to her. She was also routinely taken advantage of in the male dominated film industry. She claims that the filmmakers were not entirely honest about what they captured with the camera and so they didn't have her complete consent to put that scene in the film. Quote, I do think we have to create a think tank that really addresses 
what is a crime, what is a felony, what is consent. The name of her memoir actually comes from a life changing brain hemorrhage that she suffered in 2001 that almost killed her. It left her without the basic ability to function and she ended up losing her family, her career and a huge part of her life, which she had to start again from the ground up. Stone also talks about how she went through a childhood of and violence to a career in an industry that actually brought back a lot of those memories for her. Although in Hollywood, it was all hidden under the cover of money and glamour. Number four, Leah Remini. A former longtime Scientologist, King of Queens star Leah Remini opened up about her experiences in the church in her 2015 memoir, Troublemaker. As a teenager in the church's C organization, Remini said that she was reprimanded for stunning by the pool at the Scientology run Sand Castle Hotel in Florida, and as a pun was taken out to sea on a boat, thrown overboard, and nearly drowned by a group leader. Not only that, but she was also once fined $40,000 after confessing to stealing food from the headquarters 20 years earlier. In her memoir, Leah also made some shocking allegations about several well-known Hollywood celebrities. In fact, she recalled a time that her and her husband, Angelo, spent time at Tom Cruise's Beverly Hills mansion when he invited a group of well-known Scientologists and and other celebrities, including the Smiths. She actually called Will and Jada Pinkett Smith famous friends of the church, and even mentioned the Scientology school that they opened, revealing that despite Jada's denial, she is indeed good friends with Tom Cruise and an active member of the controversial religion. Number three, Jeanette McCurdy. Described as both heartbreaking and hilarious, iCarly star Jeanette McCurdy's bluntly titled memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, gives fans a glimpse into what really went on behind the cameras, something that that up until now, fans have only been able to speculate about. Jeanette exposes her traumatic experiences on Nickelodeon and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother, who pushed her to be a child star, noting that the persona she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was a front forced upon her by her mom, who, in addition to everything else, was extremely physically inappropriate with both her and her brother, even when they were teenagers. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed anorexia as a child and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also details numerous instances where she felt exploited as a teen actor both on and off set. The actress refers to the person behind the demands as simply the creator throughout the memoir, never naming them. She simply describes them as mean spirited, controlling and terrifying, calling a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one piece swimsuit which she preferred. The revelations in her new book are absolutely shocking, and they really expose the traumatic experience of being a child star. Number two, Christina Crawford. At the height of her fame in the 1940s, Joan Crawford had a considerable reputation to uphold. She won a 1945 Best Actress Academy Award for the lead role in Mildred Pierce. She lived in a beautiful house in Brentwood, LA, and used her wealth to adopt and raise four children, including Christina Crawford. For all of this, Joan was celebrated in the public eye and had extensive magazine spreads about her happy family life. But to her daughter, the facade was a complete lie, and eventually her frustration at the discrepancy between her mother's private existence and her public reputation bubbled over. In 1978, she published Mummy Dearest, which told the truth about her mother's character, that she was a sadistic perfectionist. It was the first tell-all celebrity memoir to talk so openly about childhood and subsequently was a worldwide sensation upon its release. In fact, it stayed at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for 42 weeks and even resulted in the 1981 film adaptation starring Faye Dunway that would go on to become a cult hit. To this day, most people associate Joan Crawford with that infamous scene where she launches into a vicious tirade after discovering Christina's dresses were hung up on wire clothes hangers. So it's safe to say that her reputation never recovered. And coming in at number one, Rose McGowan. In her 2018 memoir, Brave, the outspoken actress takes readers behind the scenes of her life in Hollywood, where she has become known as one of the fiercest and realest women fighting to expose the ugly truth about Harvey Weinstein and the systematic misogyny that has defined the industry for so long. The most outspoken of all of Weinstein's accusers, McGowan opens up about when she first met the movie mogul at the Sundance Film Festival, but only refers to him in her book as the monster 
Oscar. She was at the premiere of her 1997 film Going All The Way when he sat behind her. The next day she was sent to his hotel room where the two talked about films and her acting goals. But as he walked her out, McGowan writes that he pushed her into his bathroom, forcibly backed her into the wall and ripped off her clothes. But most shockingly, after the incident, the actress was driven to a photo op with her Phantoms co-star Ben Affleck. When she told him what happened, he simply said, damn it, I told him to stop doing that. Her memoir couldn't be more relevant to current events, as to date, 84 women have come forward with allegations against Weinstein, and he is currently serving a prison sentence of 23 years.